Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Crossroads, where faith and culture meet. I'm your host, Rita Peters, and I've got my amazing co-host, Mark Meckler, back with me today. Mark, how are you doing? I'm glad to be back with you in Off the Road for a rare change here during legislative season. (laughs) Well, we're going to talk about your adventures last week in just a moment, but before we get to that, I'm really excited about today's program because we have with us today for the first time ever on Crossroads, but hopefully not the last, the Honorable Rick Santorum. Senator Santorum was a candidate for the Republican nomination for president in 2012 and 2016 winning the 2012 Iowa caucuses, 10 additional states, and nearly 4 million votes. Prior to his campaigns for president, Rick served two terms in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, where he gained a reputation as one of the nation's leading government reformers, pro-life advocates, and national security experts. Rick, We are so honored to have you. I should mention you now serve as a senior advisor for Convention of States Action. Thank you for being with us and welcome to the program. Well, I've I've heard a lot about Crossroads and uh, I was actually somewhat envious that you never invited me to be on. So uh, (laughs) so I I feel like I've broken the glass ceiling here. Thank you. (laughs) Well, that's good to know. You will certainly be invited again. You might be sorry for that comment. Well, today we're going to talk about a new trend that the three of us are noticing in today's political environment, and I think particularly even among conservatives. It's what I refer to as bunker politics. And Rick, you were really the first one to point this out to me and identify it just the other day, and that's what inspired today's program how would you describe this trend in terms of the attitude we're seeing and hearing from so-called conservatives across the country? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's a great term, bunker politics, because when do you go into a bunker? You go into a bunker when uh, missiles are flying at you and ammunition, you know, bullets are flying at you. And 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 if you're a conservative in America uh, and you're at all engaged in the world around you because uh, you feel like everybody's shooting at you. And so <clears throat> what you see is more and more people heading into their bunkers. And in that bunker, uh, you you don't you, you you protect your you try to protect yourself and your family. And look, I, I understand it. I get it. Why why people feel that way. The problem is you, you tend just to. Um, you talk only to people who who agree with you. You get in your little tribe, uh, and you aren't uh, you're afraid of anything outside the bunker. <clears throat> and so, uh, when you have an opportunity to go on the offensive, you stay in the bunker because you're afraid that something bad might happen. Because everything around you is 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 bad. I mean, you see the culture going down, the fiscal situation, the economy, etc., and you, you just feel like. Well, nothing good can come from in, engaging the world or nothing good can come from trying to change anything because everything is just so bad. Uh, and and that that's a very dangerous that's that's hopelessness. We as Christians reject that. We 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 are we are that's that sinful behavior is to have no hope because we have the greatest hope. We have the truth. We have we have the hope in, in in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And 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 when you when you think of it in those terms, you just simply cannot uh, you you cannot be of of uh, not of good cheer. You cannot be of 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 of, uh, of hopelessness. And and so I I'm really concerned with a lot of my conservative brothers and sisters. That they are in many cases abandoning the fight, getting into their bunker, or even if they're outside of their bunker, their their whole idea is don't do anything because the world is corrupt, people are corrupt, institutions are corrupt, and you can't trust anybody. Well, that that is a recipe for further decline and failure. Absolutely. You you said it well, described the problem well. And Mark, I want to go to you now because last week when I rec- recorded the program, I mentioned to our audience you were at that time on location in Cheyenne, Wyoming, where you were waiting to testify before the Wyoming House Revenue Committee. 
you were there to support our Convention of States resolution. So because that's the background, I'm just going to briefly explain Convention of States for the sake of anyone in the audience who isn't already familiar with it. Our legislation applies for a convention of the states to propose constitutional amendments under Article 5 of the Constitution. And under our application, what we're pushing for, amendment proposals would be limited to three topics, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government, limiting federal power and jurisdiction, and setting term limits for federal officials. Those are the only three topics for amendment proposals. Now we need 34 states to apply in order to get to convention. And so far, 19 have done so. Now, Mark, with your help last week, we did pass that Wyoming committee by a vote of five to four, but then we went on to lose on the floor of the Wyoming House. We had already passed on the Senate side, but we lost on the House side. But this bunker politics was on full display in the comments that we all heard because Rick and I, too, were watching and listening in <clears> committee <throat> and on the House floor. And that was kind of what in, had us talking about this trend that Rick described and inspired the program. So talk for a minute. How do you remember that um, disturbing testimony that we heard committee and then that we heard echoed from legislators as they were debating in the Wyoming House? We had some great testimony from supporters. And and it's important to note, even when you hear the bunker politics from all the opponents, you, you, we have some leaders who step up and, and give solid testimony in support of why we need to do this and why we need to act. And and I would say as Christians, why we need to step forward and be in the fight. You know, we're supposed to take territory for Christ regardless of what's coming in the future or what we're worried about. And so we had some warriors there who were testifying in, in our favor, and I'm proud of them and pleased by that. It was really frustrating, to be honest, and I hate to even try to remember it, to hear all the bunker politics. And mostly, and this is one of the features of bunker politics that frustrates me so much, Mostly they're saying things that are actually factually untrue, that are proven to be untrue. The, the information exists publicly. We've provided the information to the folks to counter what they're saying. And, and when I say we've provided information and that it's factually untrue, I mean literally things that are proven facts for you know people saying that the 1787 convention was a runaway. That's proven absolutely unequivocally to be false. But people in their bunkers, <laughs> they're not going to pay attention to that. They're just going to repeat their talking points. And so one of the features of bunker politics that's so frustrating for me to listen to and so difficult is people repeatedly saying things that are untrue. In some cases, I would say out of ignorance because they've not looked at the materials that prove what they're saying is untrue. And in some cases, I would say out of malice, uh, just to prevent people from stepping out of the bunkers because they have seen the information. It has been provided to them and they know it's untrue. But look, once you're in your bunker, once you, you're practicing this kind of politics, your goal is to keep everybody else from coming out. It's to remove <clears throat> every shred of bravery from anybody who might stick their head out of the bunker and say, maybe we should do something. The goal becomes, I hate to put it this way, but I don't know any other way to put it, is the goal becomes to create mass cowardice. And I think it's important that we remember from a biblical perspective that God hates cowardice. God hates cowards. That's at the top of the list. God doesn't want people to be lukewarm God wants to, people to be out there passionately in the fight. And unfortunately, what we hear from a lot of these legislators directly is that they don't think anybody should be in the fight. They don't think anybody can be trusted. We'll hear legislators in the legislature, we heard this in the Wyoming legislature, not only do I not trust Washington, D.C., I don't trust anybody, literally, we heard this word, I don't trust anybody here in the Wyoming legislature. And I think that's outrageous. I think it it is a betrayal of our faith for those of us who are Christians but I also think it's a betrayal of our responsibility in the system. If you're going to be in the system and you're going to get elected to the legislature, your job is to go out and do the right thing and to lead, not to hide in the bunker. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're talking about the fear that we're hearing from people. And it really is interesting because a lot of I would say the majority of the people from whom we're hearing this are, would say that they are Christians, they are disciples of Christ. And yet we are commanded over and over and over again in the Bible, do not be afraid. 
we are to trust in the God who rules men and nations and holds all things in his hands. But we're hearing something very different when we get out into the real world. So, you know, where the rubber meets the road, do you trust in the God who is in charge of all things or are you going to be ruled by fear? And it's disturbing how often we hear people being ruled by fear. Now, Rick, as we were talking about last week, the three of us about the Wyoming um, testimony and floor debate, you mentioned that you think this this trend, this bunker politics attitude isn't just limited to convention of states, but it, it's a broader problem in our political landscape right now. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I listened to, uh, to Mark talk about the warriors that we have out there. And uh, I thought of a, another word that is very similar to that. That's a good contrast. We have warriors and worriers, and uh, and it, you know, and there is it's sort of the sheep and the goats. Uh, you know, are you going to be a warrior for for the truth? Are you going to be a warrior to uh, to restore this one nation under God and this this uh, this great experiment uh, in liberty uh, that the United States has been? Or are you going to sit in your bunker and be a worrier and just worry about all the bad things that can happen and and not do anything and be paralyzed by fear? Uh, and, you know, I hate to say it, if you know, if you look at the Christian community in particular, uh, we become more of a, a of a group of worriers instead of warriors. And uh, you see Christians in many cases just because they are so frustrated and so uh, disenchanted with with the culture, particularly the culture. I mean, yes, I think everyone's upset that the government spends spends more money and is thirty two trillion dollars in debt and is becoming tyrannical. And the, but I think most most folks are just so worried about the culture itself. And you know, you don't know what a woman is anymore. You know what a man is. You you know you, you have these drag shows that you're we're showing kids. I mean, this is this kind of stuff. You just I, I can understand how you could. Just say, I want to turn it all off. I want to just hide. I don't want to. I, I don't want to get involved. And and uh, sadly, the largest group of people who are not participating in civic life, and I mean voting, are committed Christians. <laughs> I mean, as a percentage of the population, they vote less than just about any other group. And and then they work. Then they say, well, you know, why don't things? You know, then they they look at the world and say, the world's going to hell. And you know why? And and you're like. Well, you know, one plus one equals two, right? Mm -hmm. You need the votes in order to change the policies. And and if you're not going to engage in fighting your school boards and and uh, I get I'm a homeschooler and I, I believe in homeschooling and 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 I believe if you have a bad school, you should homeschool. I agree with that. But that doesn't mean that you don't go out and you fight to to reclaim that territory. And I look at it. Another you know biblical analogy is. The Lord gives you talents. And we have just so many Christians in this country and so many conservatives in this country who are just going in their backyard and burying their talents because they're just they're afraid to go out there and uh, and engage in <clears throat> in your workplace where you're getting diversity training and you say nothing. You say, I could lose my job. Well, I don't know. lose your job, lose your soul. Let me see which one is more important. And you can say, well, I have to eat. We have a 3.6% unemployment rate in this country. You can find a job. Uh, so, so the idea that we're taking the easy way out repeatedly as believers uh, is, is, a, is a chronic problem. And so I am not surprised that we see this come to fore when it comes to convention states. We just have, some, have a bunch of people who uh, are on the wrong side of all of the parables about talents and worry and everything else. Uh, and and need to understand what they're really called to be as Christians. Yeah. You know, paraphrasing the words of Jesus, he he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. So we don't need to be hopeless, and we can trust God with the results, but we still have work to do. And our job is to carry the banner of truth in a darkened world. It's to let our light shine. It's to love our neighbors by working toward positive, truth-based public policy. 
So it is really discouraging. I know to all of us when we see this tendency of particularly conservatives and even particularly Christians who are conservatives to withdraw and retreat. I, I want to ask you, though, do you agree that this kind of attitude is particularly noticeable among conservatives? Because I see the, you know, the left side of the spectrum, liberals, being the opposite. You know, they're going forth to conquer. They are fully engaged more and more. And so why do you guys think that is? Rick, I'll go to you first. And then, Mark, I want to get your thoughts on that question as well. Well, um, I get, you know, look, I, I, let's just be honest. It's much easier for the left to go out there and and speak what they believe because they don't pay a price for doing it. I mean, the popular culture, the media, the business community now. Uh, schools everywhere. I mean, you are reinforced and validated for taking these progressive views. So I'm not saying it's easy. I don't. I, I don't want to dismiss, you know, the concerns that people have about losing their job or losing friends or all those things. But uh, you know, to your point, I mean, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, right? I mean, just just read the Beatitudes. I mean, twice he talks about persecution and suffering for him. He, he, one of my favorite lines in the Bible is pick up your cross and follow me. He doesn't say pick up your your bouquet of flowers and box of chocolates. <laughs> I mean, he didn't promise that this life was going to be. Uh, he said, you're my you know, he said you're going to be burdened. But, you know, with me, the burden is light. But he didn't say things aren't going to be hard, that suffering isn't part of it. It It is all part of the plan. It is, in fact, you know, the, the human condition. And. And we have been conditioned so much in this country and in the West generally that suffering is a bad thing and it's to be avoided. And you just sort of get in your bunker and protect yourself and and don't expose yourself to anything that could be that could be harmful or hurtful. No, no. Pick up your cross. Mm. Suffer. Go out and 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 understand you're doing it for the glory of God. And, yeah, you're going to lose. I mean, you're looking at someone. He's probably lost as many political contests as anybody in America. I mean, I've ran price for president and, you know, I've 30 some primaries lost the vast majority. I mean, I've lost, you know, probably 25, 30 times in, in a race. And, you know, here I am, <laughs> you know, I, and, and still going out there and fighting the fight. And, you know, I may not win it, but, you know, our, you know, that's for the Lord. You know, the victory is his, not ours. And you know, one of my favorite lines is that Mother Teresa said, you know, because she was interviewed by somebody saying, you know, look at, you know, this is later in her life. She says, look, you know, you're out there and you're serving the poorest of the poor and look at the poverty. You have made no difference. You know, mm -hmm. the poverty is as bad as ever. You know, people are still homeless and still suffering. And her response was, God didn't call us to be successful. He called us to be faithful. And that's mm -hmm. what we really have to focus on. Be faithful. Don't worry about winning and losing. Just God will provide. Absolutely. So, Mark, I want to get your take on this. Why do you think it is that conservatives, even conservatives who are Christians, seem to be withdrawing and retreating while liberals and progressives seem to be advancing? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to be really harsh in my assessment and I apologize in advance for that, but it's easy. It's easier to withdraw. It's easier to say I give up and I'm going to sit on the sidelines. It's easier to say, I'm not willing to take the risk. I'm not willing to suffer the social exclusion uh, or losing my job. And, and again, I, I wanna reemphasize what Rick said. I'm not saying it's easy to go out in the fight. I'm, I, it's actually easier to sit on the sidelines. I'm not saying there's no risk. There is risk. I'm not saying there's no pain. There is pain. I'll tell you when Rick and I travel around the country and we work with all these grassroots and we fight the fight that we saw fought in Wyoming. And, and honestly, Rick and I do 5% of the work that our grassroots on the ground do in those places. And we watch the pain when they lose and the struggle that they have along the way and the time that they put in and then they go there and they get so close and they lose. It's really hard stuff. So it's easier to quit. It's easier to give up and be in the bunker. And so those people that are in the bunker there, part of the reason they do it is just much easier. If you don't have to be out, if you don't have to be the man in the arena, if you don't have to engage, if you don't have to risk losing, 
<laughs> and it's just easier. And I think a lot of people, they would prefer to criticize those who are on the field of battle and take the easy way out by sitting and watching from the sidelines. Yeah. And that's really too bad because you know, as Christians, we're not given that option. We are in a war and we are called to be engaged. Now, I want to ask you about something else. I've heard people describe conservatives as people who don't like change. (laughs) And I wrote quite a bit about that idea in my book, Restoring America's Soul. I can't stand that description of conservatism. I say that conservatism is about conserving the good, the true, and the beautiful in our culture and in public policy. And if you look around today, it doesn't take very long to see that in order to do that, we need change. So how do you see that attitude affecting the political environment and actual public policy decisions, this idea of, well, conservatives don't like change. We just have to dig in and, you know, hunker down. How does that affect the broader um, political environment? Mark, I'll let you take this one first. Yeah, uh, look, I agree with your definition. I think it's perfect. In other words, we should always look and see what is the good, the true, and the beautiful and make sure that we're trying to conserve that, Uh, right? There's the story of walking into the field and seeing the fence and and the progressive or the liberal says, uh, yeah, we should just tear that fence down. And the conservative wants to know, well, why is the fence there? Let's figure out why it's there before we determine whether we tear it down or not. And I think that's the right perspective. In other words, we should always be looking at the way we do things and the way we've always done things and determine, is there a reason? Is there a purpose? Are these things that are good, true, and beautiful? And if so, let's preserve them. Let's conserve them If there's a better way, if there's a reason to tear down the fence and build it in a different way or get rid of it, then we should do that too. And, you know, I, on a personal level, I actually really love change. I mean, for me, it's one of the things that invigorates me in life is to go out and scan the horizon to see if there are new and better ways to do things. And I get a lot of personal joy out of that. So the idea that conservatives don't like change, I just don't think that that's true. Hmm. Rick, what do you think? Uh, I think you know, the uh, Russell Kirk defined uh, conservatism as the stewardship of patrimony. And mm. so you're you're given an inheritance and we have been given an inheritance in America. And I think a lot of conservatives want to preserve that inheritance. The problem is that there are groups of people out there, particularly in the last you know, 100 years, but more 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 pronounced in the last 50 years, who are changing the inheritance. They're spending a lot of that inheritance on profligate things, and they're spending down our inheritance, and they're destroying our inheritance. Uh, And so when you see that happening, uh, then it is incumbent upon us to to try to remedy that situation. And and if what we've been doing over the past (coughs) 50 years have resulted in a destruction of our inheritance, it's time to try something different, right? It's not a matter of change for the sake of change or, you know, we want to, you know, in the case of COS, we want to change the constitution. Well, if the constitution hadn't been changed over the past hundred years by, by constitutional amendment and primarily the courts, then I would agree with you. Then, then, you know, then we want to preserve our inheritance, but our inheritance isn't what it was. We are not, you know, we're inheriting a lesser and lesser rich country, if you will, rich from a from a cultural and 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 freedom point of view, and from variety of economic point of view, and in the case of, of of looking at the federal government, and and so we we have an obligation to use uh, what Mark says about change. He's talking about change in many cases in tactics and 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 how we go about doing things. I mean, he hasn't changed his opinion on any of the and on on first principles. We're not changing first principles. What we're changing is how we go about confronting this onslaught that is destroying the country. And mm-hmm. and so uh, see, to take COS, I mean, here you have a situation where there is in the Constitution a provision that provides a uh, a workable remedy. Other than we saw just this past week, Marjorie Taylor Greene you know, talk about the great divorce that, you know, we need, we need, uh, we need to separate as a country. And you say, well, that's just one kooky congresswoman from Georgia saying that. Well, 
you know, how many things have we seen that was one kooky person from from, you know, in, in Washington, D.C. saying something. And the next thing you know, that becomes the trend of the day. And and, you know, particularly within each within the bunkers, if you will, from the left and the right. And so I'm 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 very concerned about that. Uh, and and we need to use the, the tools that our wise founders have provided for us to to execute the change that's necessary to restore. So it's a change to restore. And I know that that some sounds a little uh, oxymoronic, but it is, in fact, exactly what we need to do, because uh, what what's happened over the past 50 years is a destruction of that inheritance. Yeah, it's just like, you know, abolishing slavery was change, but it was change that was necessary to conserve our first principles, our commitment to the idea that all men are created equal. So change is sometimes the good conservative thing that is necessary. Now, Rick, I see you as a great example of what I've heard referred to as a happy warrior. So I want to know, how do you maintain that attitude in the face of today's political mess? You know, people are vicious, people are hateful, people are discouraged. How do you remain a happy warrior in the face of that? Uh, experience. And I say that because I, if, if you knew me 20 years ago, you would never, I don't think you would have called me a happy warrior. Uh, <laughs> In fact, uh, it really wasn't until I ran for president um, in 2012 uh, where I was going out and because I look, I have the same feelings that a lot of the people that we're talking about who are in their bunker have, which is I feel under assault. And I was I mean, I was personally assaulted and, and vilified and uh, in, in, in the public arena for years as a United States senator. And when I ran for president, the same thing. And and so there is a bit of. Uh, in my case, it wasn't fear. I didn't bunker down, but I was angry uh, because mm -hmm. I felt like it was unjust. And I felt like, you know, that that I needed to go after these people and hit back as they were hitting me. So you punch back. Um, and, uh, you know, my campaign was doing OK because I was saying a lot of good things, but I wasn't saying it in a very nice way. In many respects, I was I was angry. And I remember having a, a conversation with my wife and, and she says, you know, I don't know who this is I'm watching because hmm. this isn't the person I know. And he said, you know, you're not you're not an angry, mean guy, but people think you are because you go out there and you're and you're just so combative. And hmm. and so we came up with the term happy warrior. And and so, you know, all the debates, I mean, if you look at my early debates versus the later debates in the 2022 campaign, you know, I tried to become a happy warrior and tried to be not just combating and confronting the evil, but also talking about hope and talking about opportunity and 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 doing it uh, in a way because, you know, I really believe as a Christian, you have an obligation to uh, to show Christ's love for everybody. And and so I think a big important part of that is in the way you approach an issue and you approach people is you don't do it with vindictiveness and anger. You do it with the love of Jesus Christ coming through you. And that is a much, much more effective way of 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 uh, of communicating an idea. So, uh, you know, I didn't win, but, uh, you know, I yesterday I was in. Uh, um, North Carolina, and I was walking through the offices, and someone came out of a Democrat. It was a it was a, a a black young man came out of, of of a Democrat senator's office, and he grabbed me. Says, "You're Senator Santorum." I said, "Yes, I am." He said, "I just want you to know." He said, "My dad and I love you." And I said, "Really?" And he said, "He said he said you gave a speech when you won Iowa on the night of the Iowa convention in 2012." You talked about working men. You talked about your grandfather's hands. You talked about the dignity of work and the working people in this country. He said, my dad just loved that. And he mm -hmm. said, I just I just want to tell you that had such an impact on me and an impact on my dad. And I thank you so much for that. OK, I lost the race. But God, God's economy is so bigger than the economy that you're thinking of. Because you're just thinking of, did I win or lose? But God thinks God God does so much with truth and talking in terms in the terms of God's love for others. Absolutely. Well said. 
We are about out of time for today. Mark, what would you tell our audience in a nutshell? What do we need to be doing to make the situation better? I think the main thing is if you're in the bunker, come out and participate and be a warrior in the fight. Be, as Rick said, a happy warrior. It's not easy, as Rick said as well, and as I'll tell you, but it is incredibly satisfying. And I think I would close with, again, reiterating something Rick just said, which is when Rick and I are on the road together and we're talking afterwards, maybe we're driving back to the hotel, the stories that we're telling each other are rarely stories of big victories in the political sense. They're stories of somebody came up to us and said, hey, you had an impact on my life or mm -hmm. I you know, there's this thing that you said that you had no idea did something for me or for my parents. Those are the things that matter most. And when you go out into the arena and you're willing to engage in the fight and you come out of your bunker, you're going to have so much impact. And it's not necessarily going to be the big picture impact. It's going to be a thousand little things that you don't know. And that's what we're really called to do. Absolutely. Rick Santorum, thank you for being with us today. We are all out of time for today's program, but I want to close by thanking our generous sponsors at Blue Ridge Chimney Services, Blessings Christian Bookstore, Sunshine Ministries with Christian Radio, Wishing Well Florists and Travel, and our good friends at New Beginnings Church and Garber's Church of the Brethren. Thank you all for listening and for your continued financial support. If you'd like to make a donation, you can do so by check to Crossroads at P.O. Box 881, Harrisonburg 22803. I'm Rita Peters with Mark Meckler, inviting you to join us again next week for Crossroads, where faith and culture meet.